today, and we are going to talk about threads in Node. <coughs> my name is Alex. You can find me on the internet. There is my website. I am also present on social networks, so there is a short uh, mirror with links to the social networks because Alex names are so complicated, it, it's shorter. Um, let's go to the history. Not Node.js, but everyone to the place where everyone appeared. And um, what you can see are chromosomes, just small parts of our DNA. And it's something what I currently invest my time and uh, it's something really interesting. It's something that drives me. Um, you can pay a uh, hundred euros or a couple of hundreds of euros and get yourself sequenced and get information about yourself, like your sequenced genome. You can do it at home also, but it's expensive. It's like 100,000 euros, and it's not really reasonable to purchase if you want to conduct some experiments at home. So something what I'm doing is the application, which helps you to anal analyze the sequence. And the history behind it is very simple. I just ordered some ancestry tests from one of the companies. And they also have medical results, unfortunately, as a <coughs> resident of Poland, I couldn't do so because their uh, services are not present here. They don't have required licenses and there are some more regulations, so it's, it's kind of hard. It's medical business. And I felt upset because like, there is some information I could probably know, but I don't. And I wanted to invest some money, I'm sorry, time in it and get like information about myself. So I created some application and I had to do a small data science and um, I had to analyze like this genome uh, which is about like 600 up to 700, 100,000 rows and map it on other databases with hundreds of thousands of rows and there are many of them you should pick information about uh, diseases names and stuff like this. So it's kind of complicated and um, it takes a lot of computing uh, power, like CPU time. So it was taking a long time, really long time. So I had to optimize it somehow. And I was already looking to some languages which are designed with uh, threads in mind, so I go. But surprisingly, I found that in Node.js 10.5, I could do threads with JavaScript and Node. So what are threads? If you have one thread, you just run operations consequently, like one operation, second operation, third operation, fourth operation. And stuff we used to think in JavaScript as a synchronous, it's basically kind of synchronous because you just send commands to some core or to some browser, depending on the platform you're running, for example, access to file system or request to your uh, to a HTTP resource. And it is happening in the background, but Node.js in this moment, it iterates and checks like, is there any next task I could possibly pick? And for example, if you take made some request to the server and uh, started running very, very huge, for example, for loop, which is not going to quit anytime soon, your callback will happen only after this cycle will uh, be finally executed. So uh, it's all about uh, event loop. Like under the hood, you have this machine which checks uh, what particular task I can take and work on now. With couple of threads, it looks a little bit different. For example, you can see that we have basically the first thread, uh, and I can put two operations simultaneously. And we are talking, when we're talking about some data uh, processing, it's uh, really can be paralleled, uh, and it can <coughs> provide you big benefits in terms of performance. And for example, there is a first operation, and when it finished, I have my thread empty, and I can put the next task in there. Um, when this task finished, I can check, okay, my second thread is still busy. It is working on operation two, but my first thread is already free. So I can put operation four in there. And when my operation two thread finish opera working on operation two threads, I, I can just uh, take operation five into this thread. So basically I can parallel tasks and work in this way. So <coughs> there is such thing as thread pool. And um, we need just to make sure we're on the same page. So 
let, let's imagine we have some threads. We put one operation in this thread. Um, it works somehow. Afterwards, second thread gets free. We put some task in there. We put some task in thread one. From thread one, um, it, it's still running. You can see that it's still running. We can launch another task in, and afterwards, we can fill the threads and work this way. And what's important that there is no really automatic solution if you want to do so with JavaScript, and you do need to do it manually. And Let's go a little bit deeper in Node.js and check what is basically Node.js and what you can need to do manually and what is working like automatically behind it. Um, first of all, um, I will show some code now. That's why I'll turn off some lights uh, to make it more visible. No, not this one. Oh, it's hard. Much harder than Node.js. Uh, so, <clears throat> first of all, uh, there is a way how you can check how many threads do you have. Uh, there is this uh, <clears throat> like global model, which is a web operation system, and which I can check how many CPUs do we have. So I will just run it in here, and we will check. So you can see that basically it says I have four processors, uh, but actually it's about threads. So those are threads I can actually use. And my laptop isn't hasn't like four cores. It has two cores with multi threading, but it means that I can execute uh, my application in four threads. Um, but let's come back to our presentation. I need to show a little bit. So when you run your JavaScript code, you have V8 engine behind this code, um, which basically runs your JavaScript. You have this binding layer, which hides and abstracts all those different things, basically like file system, like access to network. And from development perspective, it looks very similar, but under the hood, behavior is quite different. Um, and this binding level, um, works with such thing which is called libuv and it is the library which handles all your those background asynchronous operations uh, itself and how it works for example you try to access file system from the from your application it goes to libuv um, some magic is happening there and uh, as a developer you don't know what is happening there afterwards you get your file and you feel quite happy but Let's take a look what is happening under the, under the hood. So <clears throat> when you run some commands, it gets into event queue. And there is this events hoop, which is uh, works in very similar way like uh, JavaScript event hoop, but it is, a, it is able to manage threads automatically. For example, you made several consequent requests to the server, and it can put them in different threads automatically. And I have several examples. I'll show you how to illustrate it. But OK, we've got this event. We put it in some threads. Uh, after it gets executed, we get it back and transferred to the user. So how does it look like? Pretty similar to what I showed you before. We have a couple of threads. We put jobs in there, and they get executed. Afterwards, we put third job there. It also gets executed. Um, so let me show you some code. Uh, there is an example I prepared, and it is based on uh, some uh, on the crypto package. And there is a function for encryption which is called PBK DF2. And um, there was a guy. I'm not the first one who came up with this idea. His name is Stephen something sorry i don't remember his name exactly but I, I have reference to his course on udemy because he has a course like advanced nodes and he tried to explain uh different mechanics of nodes core with this and i really appreciate what he do, he's done because it it is really so simple and easy to understand and i got inspired with his idea of pbkdf2 and i decided to make a little bit different 
example to illustrate what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> I'll try to make it a little bit bigger to make sure everyone can see it. So can you see it on the last? Uh, OK. So it's quite simple. There is a function for login. And the only thing it does, it just deducts uh, the time, uh, actual time, and deducts from it uh, time when it has been started. And it also passes the number, like you can see like this one, because we'll call it several times, and we want to differenti differentiate uh, when it has been finished. So we have only one execution now, and let's launch it and check if everything is working correctly. So. You can see that I have executed this uh, function uh, and it taken a little bit more than one second. Um, it's blocking operation because if I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, non blocking operation, but uh, let's try and uh, execute two functions. Like we will think that if it's synchronous, it will be executed like one after another one way or other way, doesn't matter how it's going to be represented to the user, but let's check it. Will two executions be longer than one execution? You can see that it's not two seconds. It also depends on like environments, the process which are running, but the fact that gets finished about in the same time because they do about the same job. Like encryption is pretty, this, uh, that thing which you can estimate how much time it's going to consume. And you can see that basically it takes the same time. Okay, um, we've seen that I have four cores. So let's try to run it on four cores, uh, four threads, I'm sorry. And you can see that over each time has been increased, but not for time, four times. And I still uh, get results almost in the same time back. Um, what will be uh, what will be happening if I will add like fifth uh, execution here? And I need to fix numbers. First four already, and fifth has been executed after a while, and I haven't managed anything to run it separately. I have just added this operation. Uh, afterwards. So if we'll come back to our presentation, it will mean that basically we had like four threads here and they got busy and last one was waiting in a queue and when uh, at least one of those uh, jobs has been finished, it was placed into the thread. Um, there were different workarounds how you can do it, so like different exec, fork, and stuff like this, which was widely adopted for the web servers because it's really reasonable when you're trying to uh, handle some high load or if you're trying to handle streaming, and it kind of works. And there are some solutions, but what is behind this idea? Like you have uh, your node application, you have some threads, you have core, and so it goes to CPU. Now I'm talking only about JavaScript code, so let's keep LibUV apart and talk about codes you run and spend time in JavaScript. Um, and eventually, it couldn't afford to take your request because it's busy, it's operating, and new request is coming. And what user does? He's waiting. <coughs> and there are packages uh, which hide uh, the following architecture. So they put load balancer in front of uh, different nodes in different threads, as I mentioned before. So they run the application, different instances of your web server in different threads. And when user is coming, we just check like which threads, which instances are still available and just wrote user to the available uh, threads where it gets served. <coughs> so kind of something like this. There is already solution which does all the magic. Um, it works kind of out of the box. And let me demonstrate, give you some simple example. <coughs> I will use a package which is called Artillery. It's 
software which allows me to conduct some simple performance tests and, and I will run uh, this server. Now I will run it just with Node, so oh, I'm sorry. And also, we will try pushing it. And it doesn't work. How I like it. Um, obviously. So it will mean that I will try to launch uh, 20 requests and 10 uh, parallel uh, flows. So you can see that in average, if I will try to push it that hard, I get my response. I will try to make it slightly bigger if I, yes, I think I can do so. So you can see that median, like average time, which uh, user waited to get served was like 800 seconds. It's not really good and it can be just improved if you run your node application with PM2. So let's try to do so. Oh, it was not the best idea. Oh, no. Here we are. Um, the commands I launched, uh, you can see that I use this notation like IMAX, it means that it will uh, set up as many instances, as many threads I have automatically without asking me how many threads I need. And if I'll try to launch the following test again, I expect that we'll see a totally different results. Yes, you can see that medium, median was significantly smaller and it is about as four times smaller than result I shown you demonstrated you pre previously. But you may ask me, like, what is going to hap happen if I launch like hundred threads? Like, will it become faster or not? And I also have a demonstration for it. So let's come back to example I shown you with this libuv threads because it's quite illustrative and simple to demonstrate. You can see that if I will try to add more. threads I will significantly lose in time because they will be executed in batches and the same applies basically to PM2 if you try to run more uh, instances then you have, have <coughs> possibility you'll get not in the better best situation so um, it was the way how I tested. You can experiment with it on your own. You can try to penetrate your own application and check is it ready to some high load. But it's really useful test and conducting it sometimes can uncover some issues you have with your codes. And I think it's a good prophylactic to do uh, with your codes. Here are some examples. I wasn't sure I will run it here because things happen. So basically I had about the same results at home. So with cluster, I had better average response time and like extremes were also lower, so it kind of works. And the best part of it that it has some automatic respawn. If your script got failed, it can be uh, respawned and launched again. So it's also provided some basic resistance against uh, errors you can have on the server. And so let's talk about worker threads. It's something what was added uh, in Node 10.5 um, and it is totally uh, similar in its conception to web workers you're probably familiar in the web and yes working tra worker threads are still experimental you need either modify your node configuration or run it with a flag always a specification may change there are some discussions what to do with it considering the problem with all those vulnerabilities 
like Spectre, <coughs> Spectre and uh, stuff like this, Meltdown. And it's, it's basically a big issue currently with the technology. So <coughs> yes, you need to write or <coughs> run it in experimental mode. It provides you an API and here you can see the simplest stuff you need to use. And basically it's not the most convenient thing you did, you've done in Node.js because all those are going to be global variables you will have. Um, parent ports, worker data will in some magic way, uh, magical way, receive data from other workers. And let me show you some example of it and take a look how it may look real quick. Um, it's kind of ugly, but it illustrates what we are working with and what is going to happen. <clears throat> there are different way how you can exchange data between different uh, workers. I'll talk a little bit, also a little bit later today, but <clears throat> if you'll take a look what is happening, I just imported that uh, worker thread stuff. I imported chunk uh, function from Wadash because I want to split uh, my array into several equal arrays. Um, I have variable wor worker counts because I want to change it and take a look what is going to happen. Um, I created a function, uh, which is basically a hack, but it allows me to check was it the way last worker which was finished recently or there are some other workers which are currently in execution. Um, start time because I want to get, uh, measure how much time I spent and check, like, was it at all beneficial or just some boring stuff. Um, I created a function which will just iterate the part of this array will pass in there. And it will just uh, increment also this value. So some operations will, we need to waste some CPU time. Um, what else? Uh, results which are going to be used to determine like is it was was it the last element or not uh, workers um, and what is happening here is basically I'm just iterating over uh, the list of workers I have and create not list of workers but uh, I create a new worker and I leave the last part of our array we chunked with Wadash to our primary flow where we not fraud, fraud, but thread where we execute our applications so in this cycle, in this loop, we have just created uh, workers. So if we'll have like 10 uh, workers defined in configuration, we'll get nine workers here. And one iteration will happen outside of any worker and it will be executed in the main file. Um, and after each execution, I'll check like, was it the last one or not? Um, what else? You can see this global variable, which is called is main thread. It's global variable, which I kind of imported out of here, but it also helps me to check, is it the main thread where I run my application? Because if it isn't, I just want to iterate, like do this meaningless iteration and post message back to the main thread. And you can see this handler, like, uh, if something has happened, I will just try to quit. So let's try to launch it and check if it's going to work or not. Um, it's okay. You can see that it has taken 10 seconds. Um, what is going to happen if we we'll add a couple of additional threads? Let's make two, for example. So first execution was only in main thread because there wasn't reason to create an additional thread. Now we'll have main threads and worker we have just created. So I've done the same mathematical operation, but slightly faster. So let's try four. Is the maximum amount of threads which is reasonable to use on my machine. Oh. So 
So you can see that it becomes faster. Depending on what you are doing, difference might be bigger or smaller, but for my particular case, where I was comparing array of strings with array of strings, it was significantly faster and it saved our hours of work. Um, and the same as I demonstrated before, if I increase uh, amount of workers, when, for example, do seven, just to have numbers, more difference and more illustrative. You can see that I may I got more threads and number is bigger. I can try 70 threads. Definitely on the faster already. So we can see that it has taken more than it taken when I launched it first without any workers. So reasonable amount of workers makes a big difference. Luckily, you can check it with configuration of nodes with those global variables you can import in your application. Um, there are some limitations because you couldn't access many nodes APIs out of there. You couldn't import, for example, file system and work directly from file system. You need to import your file split it, prepare somehow, and put some chunk of data into your worker. Um, it, it's not something hard, but it's something you need to get used to. And another issue that exchanging data between threads is kind of painful. You've seen like this, my hack around try quit, where I was checking like how many data I received, post message, uh, receiving all this stuff. And if you have really simple operations, you pay more for this post message interface than for actual results. And uh, there is a big difference between all this exact stuff and stuff like this and uh, worker threads because worker threads um, have a possibility to share memory. So let's talk about it. But again, worker preferable thread may work. Um, too many workers are bad. Creating workers isn't time free because it's really expense for creation, it's expense for memory location, it's expense for fetching data out of it, it's ex expense for destroying the worker. Um, there is a um, way how you can manage it. You need to keep your worker active if you're not using it and put some uh, launch it again when you need it. It's cheaper than launching it every time when you need it and destroying it afterwards. Um, Exchanging data with workers isn't time free. So again, it may um, make it not reasonable for you if you're not conducting some heavy uh, job with JavaScript. So what you can use it for? You can use it for heavy data manipulation. You can use it for machine learning. You, you, can, you can basically do machine learning with Node.js. There are even a couple of different libraries which allow you to do so. Um, I'm not ready to talk, is it reasonable or not, but you can. You can manipulate with different files. You can start compression of image, for example, and put it in different threads. But what you need to note before doing it, many contemporary libraries for image conversion you can use nowadays. They have already been built on top of some C or other package, which allows you to do it in different threads. That's why you probably won't benefit out of it if you were going to use some third-party library. Compression, conversion, all this stuff, because it's kind of hard and it takes some time to do. Video streaming, and what's also reasonable, there are many experiments around Webpack, how to make it build faster, because um, you can basically put unit tests in one thread or in a couple of threads, you can uh, do transpiling of styles and JavaScript in parallel. There are existing libraries which allow you to do so and benefit sometimes is really significant, but it's not stable. It's not supported with some orders and there is a big work to do. Um, before I went to the references, um, before you started working on it, you need, sure that, you need to make sure that it will increase complexity of your code. If you are working with a team, it might be a big price. Like a couple of dollars on servers are not going to be cheaper than a couple of thousand dollars which you will pay to people 
we, which we will just spend time trying to check how it works. Um, calculate in the first place is it reasonable? And there are classical solutions for clustering, as I mentioned, PM2. Shared memory is very important stuff. I think there won't be any code more, so I can turn off back the lights because we are recording. Um, the stuff you can see there is a uh, refrigerator and a dormitory. And for example, purchase some food you put in there, you expect that you have some food in this refrigerator, you are coming, opening this refrigerator and you can see this. And it is something what really illustrates what shared memory is. You can put some value into array, you expect that you have it there, but when you access this array, you couldn't find any, this value anymore. And shared memory is a big and very big issue now, because probably you heard of those two guys, two vulnerabilities, Spectre and Meltdown. And they basically use and leverage this mechanism, which is used for shared memory in different languages, including JavaScript, because it's basically a hardware problem. And Unfortunately, it's the reason why mechanisms for shared me memory was, were disabled in browsers, because previously you had access to this shared array buffer in the browser, currently you couldn't do so. It was turned off and it's still under discussion, a discussion of TC committee, what to do with it, because currently it's not clear how to protect users and enable this feature back. Um, there are different ways how you can work with it, but they are not easy in any way. First one is array buffer. It's technology which weighs behind this shared array buffer. It's possibility to create some data structure which will fit only specific types of data with specific length. So you couldn't just create an array and put whatever you want there, like a couple of Redux states, photos of your granny and video done what yesterday. So it's, it doesn't work this way. And um, there are very defined type array views. So you just define how long this buffer could be and you build your data structure on top of it. And shared array buffer, it is currently available only in Node, um, probably in Chrome with flag, but um, in Chrome it's not so dangerous. I, I mean, Node is not, not so dangerous. So <coughs> um, it's hard because it forces you to write a lot of boilerplate code, which is not obvious. Um, it can easy to get misled with this code, and it's even harder to explain to your team members why you need it, why it is more beneficial than this post message mechanism I showed you before. Um, it's kind of uh, reasonable when you want to save some time on performance, because one of the reasons why performance doesn't increase exactly four times when I put more threads. It's expense I spent for this post uh, data mechanism, post message mechanism. And with shared array buffer, you can access the same data structure from the different um, parts of your application. It's not something which allows you to store really big data because you need to estimate how big it's going to be. But if you want to have some information, like was it the last one or was it wasn't the last one, you can use some kind of bit mask uh, and uh, put it into your array buffer. Like every element of your array can be some bit and you can check how it works. Um, it's basically a part of standard already. It's uh, ECMAScript 2017. Um, it's supported by some browsers currently with flags because it was damaged by vulnerabilities, but it was supported almost everywhere. It's global singleton in every thread, which allows you to access this data structure and it hides memory implementation behind itself. So you shouldn't have some complicated magic with the shared array buffer every time you can just uh, use the library, which is called Atomics. I'll share this presentation. That's why I decided to put some references, like picture to demos. They are pushed to repository. You can play with them. And there is also a good uh, topic from Mozilla with pictures, how multi-threading multi works. And uh, the channel of this guy on Udemy, the, his course, uh, Advanced Nodes, 
where you can find more examples how LibUV works and what is the magic is happening behind the <coughs> scenes there. So that's it. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Okay. Uh, I didn't. I didn't, and I wouldn't try to speculate. So I know that it's possible. There are some solutions, but I couldn't elaborate. Um, sorry, I forgot your recording, and we need to give you a microphone. <laughs> Hi. So in the one of the first examples that you showed, mm -hmm. uh, I think with the compression example, mm -hmm. Uh, you showed us that a uh, single compression task took us like uh, 1200 milliseconds mm -hmm. and then you have added another uh, executions and the time increased even though you still had three, two and ones per course in your computer. Why those haven't been executed in 1200 seconds? Uh -huh. And the second thing, maybe not not the question really, but my ignorance, could you also sell, say a little bit how threads compare to their promises and how this is handled? Like uh, mm -hmm. this is single thread in Node by default? Uh, it is one thread in Node for a code which is executed in, thread, uh, in Node. For example, some mathematical operations, some cycles and stuff like this. But when you execute promise, for example, you call some remote server and you execute promise and you type then. Basically what is happening under the hood that uh, you started this command and you pass this command to libuv, this library which is hand, uh, which, uh, responsible for handling uh, loose operations asynchronously. And okay. for Node.js, there are are no operations happening there. So it picks from the event loop the next operation. And when we got response from the server, libuv pushes this data back to our node application, to our event loop, and it will be pick picked as the next operation when it will be available. So <clears throat> uh, threads are not about uh, competing with promise in any way. It can be used with promise, uh, for example, but uh, threads about uh, doing some tasks which can be done in parallel, uh, we can do in them in parallel because when you execute, for example, your application in one thread, it takes some memory, but you have basically more memory and memory currently cheap. And you can uh, run it in several <coughs> um, threads. It will consume more memory, but it will be executed faster. And you asked also like, why it's not uh, the same as it was in the beginning and why it's still growing. Like if we would execute it instead of four threads, one after another, we'll have like a 4,800, for example, but we've got only 2,500. And it's not as small as it was with one thread for one single operation, but um, we also pay expenses to create this worker. We also pay expenses to memory allocation and some additional expenses, which are also supposed to happen around all this process of spawning a new thread of allocating this job in this particular thread and stuff like this. So it wouldn't uh, be linear. It couldn't be close to the value you had with a single thread, but it wouldn't be the same. And it's still cheaper than if we would run these commands one after another. So it's still like uh, two times cheaper than we would run it one after another. Okay, thank you. I was just... Uh wondering because those operations were separate so that there wasn't any uh, sharing of the resources between them. But okay, thank you for the explanation. Uh, I mean, it's still happening. You Under the hood, you notify uh, <coughs> underlying layers what is going to happen. This event loop is still happening and you need to put value from Q. You need to put it to uh, your uh, <coughs> threads. And it was also important that it also uh, consumes more memory now. Uh, I mean, operational memory RAM. 
and my RAM is also limited on my laptop because if I would have more RAM, it also might be a little bit faster, but you still pay some price for creating a worker and you couldn't escape it. Mm -hmm. oh. Hey, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm not Node developer, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe I missed the information. Is this crypto uh, library, is a uh, JavaScript library, or this is a native compiled package? It's native compiled package, which is executed by Libre. So this is Libre. why it uh, uses uh, yes. threads. Okay. And it's, for, it's a nice illustration of what is happening with stuff like HTTP, with stuff like uh, FS, with stuff like curl commands and other built-in node modules you can import without additional installation because they are kind of built in into the core of node. And they already compiled packages for different platforms. So they support multi-trading like from the very beginning. And it was yes, just yes, illustrative. I, I, I mm -hmm. Just uh, wondering about, about mm -hmm. this difference, uh, why, uh, native, why uh, typical uh, JavaScript uh, node code uh, can be run, uh, can't be run on, on more than one thread and something what is in C++, for example, could be. I mean, it was already written at some point to run in several threads. And by the way, what is also good about all this multi-threading and Node.js is that it dramatically increases portability of code because if you want to port some code from, to say, C++ to Node.js, uh, you couldn't just rewrite it with syntax of Node because it was uh, designed in the way to use threads and currently it can do so. So it also increases chances that we will get some libraries from other languages be written natively in Node.js because it became easier to write it in the same style. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Thank you. Oh, so sorry, I missed you. Do you also have your uh, DNA analysis tools open source or are you other making some uh, business? They are not open source now. Um, I tried to push this idea to several places and I discussed with people in business, but you'll see at some point. Uh, personally, I'm afraid to push it open source anyway because people can do some analysis, <laughs> see some results. For example, I can check and I can see that I have like 25 per more persons to have cancer of liver. I will go to the hospital, purchase some ticket, some pills, preventive pills, and I will drink them, and will kill other organs. You know, so I don't really want uh, want to go to legal fields alone, and publishing it open source means that I will go to this legal field alone. Yes, so there are some alternative services which do not the same but very similar stuff, and you need to check like eight check boxes when you supply results that you agree with different regulations. It's medicine and it's not the best place where you can put stuff open source, I think. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yes. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Then we'll have...